here. So, um, what I want to talk about, uh, and actually what I'll cover, is the future alternatives, you know, where you can go from here, uh, what the timelines would be, and then um, answer questions. Um, so the first background I want to give you is, uh, I usually do this for cities because we have a very unique system in Washington State, and that is the entire state is covered with underlying certificate areas that the state regulates. And cities can choose to opt out of that system, or they can choose to stay in it. And I think, for example, um, Kenmore is a city, but they're still state regulated. They never elected to exercise their, their ability to do it. If you want to exercise the city's ability to, to go for a, a UTC collection area, you need to give the existing hauler seven years plus three, what has it ended up being three years measurable damages in order to even get city authority over the area. And that applies not only to newly incorporated cities, but to annexation areas. So when you annex an area um, in the future, uh, you don't get control of that area uh, until you go through a certain process. And a lot of cities don't do it, and so they end up with a bit of a tangle. I mention that because your current contract is structured to exert city control over the annexation areas. Um, so you've got that base covered for some annexations but possibly not for others. So that's something you'd have to come back to and look at. Um, the current contract is negotiated 2001-2002. Issues included concerns about cost service and to clarify collection authority. I should also add <clears throat> that during this time period, actually after that, there was a fairly significant change uh, in hauler service areas. And I'm just going by memory right now, but I think waste management had the surrounding unincorporated certificate. Race, waste Management Republic did a massive swap of service areas. It covered Bremerton, SeaTac, Burien, unincorporated areas on the east side. And I think that's how Republic got the service area around the city. So what it used to be, and I, this is my recollection, I, don't, I can't give you 100% certainty on this, but my recollection was the city of Duval was in the middle of a waste management service area and your contractor is waste management. What's happened since then is waste management has Duval, but doesn't have any of the surrounding areas. So you're kind of a, you're off um, in the distance from their base of operations. Um, I'd have to check that more. I didn't actually uh, look into that in any great detail. Um, but basically, at that time, it was to clear up annexation issues, uh, and then of course it went into the contract that's extended for 10 years. Um, the 2009 amendment allows for two, up to two year extensions. So either through 2021 and 2023, you've already exercised the first one. So right now your uh, contract's ending at the end of December of 2021. Excuse me. Um, so uh, you've got basically four options. You can, uh, well, on top of extending to get uh, another two years. You can conduct a competitive procurement, which would likely be an RFP. Um, the haulers typically will not respond to RFBs. They do not do bids. Um, some cities have tried to do bids and they've gotten no response. They're not interested in doing bids. Um, they want to sell their services and have an opportunity to come in and see how they're better than their haulers. So it's almost all RFPs these days. Um, your other option is to negotiate a new contract with waste management. Another option we talked about 17 years ago was to revert to the state authority. Uh, basically just turn the whole service area over to the city and say, we don't want to do with garbage, we don't want to do with recycling, just subsume us into the underlying uh, state regulated system. And uh, you can walk away from it. I would say that uh, that is something that can be attractive, and we'll get into that, but uh, I certainly wouldn't recommend it in your case. Uh, and then the last is uh, shifting to the municipal collection. Uh, I've worked for a number of cities that are uh, where the entire county is one hauler, and so it's essentially a monopoly, and so a city can either accept the monopoly or they can uh, do their own collection. And so you've got a lot to do their own collection. You know, Port Angeles would be an example, and uh, Oak Harbor is an example, some of the towns are scheduled are examples. Um, so I'll cover the, the options here. Um, so the first option, uh, and this is just talking about exercising the extension. Um, so I shifted from four options to five options. But ultimately, you've got a two-year extension option, an additional one. I would say it's the easiest path. If you had other things that council was in the middle of dealing with, you just didn't want to deal with this, you could set it aside. 
Um, and your existing rates and services would continue through um, 2023. Um, I'd say the con cons on those are that, from my recollection, the original objective of the city was to get clear authority to customize services and go through a competitive process. Admittedly, that's a different administration, a different council, but that was originally in town. Um, you also have pretty high rates. I looked at your rates, uh, and I didn't spend a whole lot of time doing the rate analysis, but um, I thought they were pretty high. But I also understand that you're an island for waste management away from their base of operations. Um, I would say an updated contract would allow for better services for customers and more control over the city, um, particularly over contract performance. You would be able to say what happens when this is, you know, there's a lot of updated information and, and more modern contracts about how you do mist recovery, how you do handle inclement weather, uh, what sort of penalties there are if there's strikes and there's not collection. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that are in current generation contracts that you don't have. Um, and I would say the biggest con is that the decision will be right back in right in two years if you just went ahead and did an extension because you'd be in the same position you're in today, only two years down the road. <clears throat> Another option is a competitive RFP. Um, in my experience, it ensures that customers get the best services and market-tested rates. It provides the city with the most leverage to specify the contract term that it wants. Um, and there's a favorable public perception of the competitive process for what's usually the largest contract to um, And there, I, I hate to say this, I said likely, possibly rate reductions, but that's a dangerous place to go. So I, I you know, that's no promise, but again, I go back to market-tested rates. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> question. Sure. So a competitive RFP, in your experience in this region, mm -hmm. how many companies put in, especially what's your experience tell you about Duval being an island? And well, there would be three. Um, and on some of them there are four, but you're you're not close enough, I think, to another service here for waste connections to be interested. Uh, I'd say the three would be, of course, waste management, uh, Republic Services would definitely uh, be interested. And then Recology, you're distant from their operating base, but I think your demographics are something to be very interested in. They just won Mercer Island, um, and they kind of go for, uh, I hate to call them a boutique service sort of player. Right there. <laughs> Where's their base? Their base, um, well, that's a good question. Mostly in Seattle. But they're did they evaluated. start down in Pioneer Square? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. Did. But they've been, they have Bothell, so they've kind of been eyeing a, a northern King County, South to Holmes County base, and they're also looking at, at putting a base in Auburn. Okay. I think they might have Carnation. They do have Carnation. Yeah, which is, yep. they're not that far. From yes, them. yes. But <laughs> their truck base and their processing facilities okay. and everything else, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, there's, there is a competitive environment there. Um, on the cons, there, it is, it's a spasm of staff effort, you know. Every 10 years or every 20 years, something comes up and it, it, is, it is quite a haul. Uh, you know, you have, um, base, I'll get into what the schedule is, but basically um, I do the documents, the contract, the process, the, um, the rate analysis, the final negotiations, but I do not do qualitative review of the proposals because that gets into a harness nest for me. If I'm ever saying company A is better than company B mm -hmm. at this, um, pretty soon yeah. the process goes sideways. And so somebody has to do it from the city. Uh, and so it takes a bit of effort to go through that of qualitatively scoring proposals. Um, there is a consultant expense. Um, typically the, the year long process that I am involved or a year and a half uh, ends up being, depending on the size of the city, it's somewhere 25,000 plus minus. Um, but um, there's a contract signing fee at the end of this whole process that where the hauler essentially pays for it. They give the city a check to cover both consultant and staff expenses. We specify it up front, and then they just work into the rates. So it doesn't end up, a lot of the cities I've worked for don't, this sneaks up on them, and they don't have a budget for it. And so that was a big incentive to structure things so they're self-funded. Um, and then the other thing that's, that may or may not occur is some cities have gone through this process when they've still had a second extension available and uh, haulers have refused to submit a bid. And their concern is, or submit a proposal, their concern is that if they know the rates are going to go up, 
they won't bother submitting because they know the city could just abandon the process and exercise their two-year extension. I don't think that's such a big deal, but it's something that we would have to have on the table is whether the city would explicitly forego that second option as part of the RFP process and say, our contract is ending at the end of 2023. That's it. And so, and have a resolution or something that says, and the council's committed to this process, very transparent, you know, whatever the words are. Um, so the haulers can be very, very well assured that if they invest the money in submitting a proposal, that the city will carry through the process and award a contract out of it instead of just pulling it to extend the contract. <clears throat> the third option is to negotiate a new contract with waste management. Biggest pro is just there's no potential transition to a new contractor. Um, you know what you've got, you know how they work, they know your routes, there's no, no transition. Um, no matter how good an incoming contractor is, there always is two, three, four weeks a month of shifting out carts, you know, getting, you know, somebody is used for 20 years to put their uh, cart right behind these bushes in this certain spot and park their car in front, and the current contractor knows that the new contractor wouldn't. So there's that kind of stuff. So the pro is there's no transition. Um, the other pro is that it could uh, require less staff or consultant work than RFP. It's often close to that, though, uh, because it is very difficult to negotiate contracts. Uh, they don't open their books. They go off comps with other cities. Uh, you go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And at the end of the day, somebody has to stand up in front of you and say, I know we got the best deal we could have. And you can't really say that because you don't know you got the best deal that you could have. So it's this, it's this really tough process to negotiate. And I do negotiations, but not anymore. <laughs> I think I'm done with that. Yeah. Um, one other thing for the council, we talked earlier. Can you tell, tell us uh, the time estimate you think? So if you started negotiating. Well, I can, I'll get to that. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and then I have a last bullet on here, which is, I think, incorrect, so I'm not going to talk about it. Right, the annexation issue, I was going off my notes, and I think life has superseded that. So I'd have to double check who, who which haulers have which, which areas. Um, and the cons are the city's unlikely to get the best rates or contract terms, and then there's the public perception. You know, sole sourcing a contract of that size in that period might get you some attention. So, um, Moving right along, option four, revert to UTC authority. <clears throat> the city wouldn't need to manage the contract at all. It would just go away. And uh, basically, whatever your certificated hauler does is what you get. And if there are complaints, they'll probably still contact you, but actually they need to contact the state, just like they would with future power. You know, it's a state-regulated system, cost plus. And um, it, is a, it is an option that smaller cities may choose to do. Uh, because often they don't have a lot of staff to manage a contract and it's easier just to turn it back to the state. Um, the cons, uh, you don't have a lot of uh, ability to influence services. You can do some, you can set a service level ordinance that, that tells a hauler to do certain things, but not other things. So you would lose a lot of the control you would otherwise have over deciding, you know, do you embed compostables collection, yard waste collection for everybody? Or do you have the subscription base? All these things you can't decide if it went to the state. Um, the other thing is regulated rates under the UTC cover an entire service area. So you can have a rural area. In my example, there's an area that's 40 miles from Bellingham that pays the same rates that I pay for um, in the city of Bellingham. There's massive, uh, in some cases, there's massive uh, urban rural cross subsidization. And that was part of the deal with how these certificates were set up. They, they agreed to collect this entire service area in exchange for charging the uniform rate across it. So if you're a city in the middle of that area, you're subsidizing the more rural areas by being part of that certificated area. And then the last con is that you'd be walking back from a 17 year effort to gain control um, and be able to reset your contract. Um, then a fifth option is municipal collection. That's not very popular in King County. In other counties it is. Basically, you go out and buy equipment, uh, a three or four hundred thousand dollar truck or several, and all the containers, and you run as a city utility. Um, you know, sometimes it can complement other public works functions like put plows on the front or that sort of thing. 
Well, and I would say in King County, uh, other than Enumclaw, that's just doesn't get any traction. And I would say the cons are the city's in a competitive service region. The city would need to make its own arrangements for recycling and composting. Uh, because you're part of a King County system that gives you access to transfer stations, but you're not part of uh, the private haulers that run the recycling and composting operations, or Cedar Grove runs that composting. So, <clears throat> since those services aren't provided by regional government, um, you'd be on your own. Rate impacts are unknown, and actually, uh, operational issue is you don't have any close adjacent cities that also do that, that you can have a backup equipment arrangement with. Because if you've only got one truck, to pick up garbage and your truck goes down for a week or two, you don't have another city to pool your spares with. <clears throat> Sorry for chugging water. Got really dried out with all the AC. I'm not used to it. <clears throat> um, so on timelines, uh, negotiations usually take several months. Uh, at the best, it could take three, four, five months. At the worst, it could go on for a year and a half. Um, they can take a lot of time. And uh, sometimes, from a staff perspective, you can take a deal to council, and council can say, no, but did you consider this? And you go back and do that, and you start all over again. Um, but some cities choose to do negotiations in front of a competitive process. So they say to the current hauler, we'll try to negotiate with you. As of this date, if we don't have a deal that council likes, we're immediately executing a RFP process. Um, yeah, let's leave it at that. <laughs> you can stack that in front of an RFP process if you've got enough time. The next bullet I had was that a municipal the procurements RFPs usually take 20 to 24 months. And that's 8 to 12 months for a process, depending on how what you put into it. If you put in customer surveys and a lot of front-end stuff, they'll, they'll take 12 months. If it's a panic, I can do them in 6 months or even less. Uh, and then you need to be all done with the process and have council approval of the contract about 12 months before the start of the contract. Because the time uh, it takes to get a truck nowadays is pretty close to 12 months. Um, you can't just buy them off the shelf. So uh, you definitely need to start a couple years in advance. Uh, and I did have a timeline. I don't know, unfortunately, this was the one thing that's handy to look at. Um, but basically, uh, an example of how it might work would be um, if you started January 1st of next year, uh, you've got six weeks or so to scope out the new contract and services and do your internal review and city attorney review of, of that draft. And then what I do is I, I release an industry review version. Uh, so I take the RFP and the con draft contract and I send it to every known proponent and I say, you've got two weeks to look at this. Let us know if there's anything you don't like, if there's anything you think is anti-competitive, um, and if there's something we haven't considered. And the reason I do that, <clears throat> and that's something I've only done for the past few years, is it really takes the wind out of their sails if you get to a council process and you stand up right when you're trying to approve a contract and say, but you didn't consider this, or there's this. There's actually a process to get all their input up front, to respond to it up front as part of the RFP, and then everybody knows the rules. It's very transparent. Um, so then I have industry comments would be, uh, industry review comments would be back uh, due uh, beginning in March. We'd release the RFP, uh, including a legal notice uh, mid-March, uh, get proposal questions, uh, RFP questions mid-April, and proposals due next June, and then basically go through the summer with proposal evaluation interviews, clarification, selection, uh, and try to get it to council in September of 2020. And then if the contract was executed in 2020, um, then that's actually more like uh, 16 months ahead of it. Now this schedule can go forward or back uh, probably four months. You've got lots of time uh, to consider things. You could start uh, as soon as next month, uh, and you could start uh, early spring next year, and you'd still be okay. Uh, you wouldn't have a problem. Um, and that's what I had written down. So I got moved to questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. Could you describe a little bit what the staff effort looks like? I know that probably varies a lot, but mm -hmm. being a smaller city with less staff, I was just curious, is it, you know, if we're working with a consultant, what does that look like in terms of what kind of strength is that? Yeah, um, there's less meddling. <laughs> no, I, I've worked for big staffs with solid waste coordinators, and those time, th that takes a lot of time. 
because you've got lots of multiple reviews through many levels. Um, when I work for smaller cities, I usually sit down and talk with the staff that would be managing the contract about what uh, preferences would be for customers. And then I just go back and I write a draft contract, I send it back to them, they review it. We go back and forth a couple times tailoring it because there's a mix between what you're currently doing and what you might want to, you think your customers might want to do. And then of course there's always the option of doing a survey, but that's a different topic. Um, and then I go off and I write uh, a penultimate draft. Um, and then that goes out. And the industry is in there too. But basically, uh, once the city attorney says yes, then it goes out. And I answer all the questions that come up in the RFP process, coordinating with staff, uh, do the addendums. Uh, and then when the proposals come in, I just check them uh, to make sure that they're, uh, they conform to the requirements and they're responsive. And they, they essentially always are. There are little details that they miss here and there because it's a complicated thing to deal with. But unless there's something that's material, they're okay. I do the rates, figure out who got the rate score. Uh, and then the city, city staff can choose what level they want to dial in. Uh, a lot of city staff choose to go look at recycling facilities, composting facilities, the truck operation base. They do an interview um, and they may check references too, see what the experience of other cities have been as far as um, managing the contract. So I would say probably over the, uh, particularly the heat of the valuation, I would say um, the staff, one or more staff members probably spend about 40 hours plus okay. dealing with that. And then, of course, there's the whole, um, a lot of times I ghost write staff reports, but sometimes not, uh, depending on city preference. And then uh, there's a council process and that takes staff time. Okay. Thanks. Um, I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. So I agree our rates seem very high. I made a spreadsheet at some point a couple years ago, and I was surprised at how high ours were compared to others. And um, I do see that we get a franchise fee, which I'm not sure how typical that is. It seems Fair. quite, okay. Um, so I'm not sure how we compare in that aspect, if that's part of why our rates are higher. I think, um, I think it's pretty low, actually, your franchise fee. Is they range from 1% uh, in some cases up to 15% or so. Okay. And I think I try to just eyeball it. Uh, because yours is, has a very unique way of handling it, but I think right. it's about a two percent or two and a half percent. But I don't quote me because I'm being recorded. I think it's around. <laughs> okay. okay. I think that's what it equates to. We also get utility taxes. That's in to it, on. which is right. That's yeah. what I wasn't sure. Um, so even with that in consideration, you think that our rates are still high, particularly for those that subscribe to compostable collection. Yes, okay. because your compostable collection is pretty, fee is pretty healthy, and then our line garbage fee is pretty healthy. And you add those two up, and I think for a 48 gallon, I mean a 32 gallon customer that has both services, I think it was like 48 or 45 dollars a month, yeah, high. which is high. It feels very high, and it's been a complaint. <laughs> yes. From yes. Yes. That's, That's very high. Um, and then my other question is, we've talked a lot about the timing, is this a bad time to be negotiating just because of um, everything that's going on with recyclables? Uh, I don't think so. Um, the newer generation of contracts, well, the older generation of contracts always had all the reward and risk go to the, the hauler. And that's because it's really complicated. The hauler decides how much to emphasize how clean the materials are coming in. You know, if they want to slow down routes to start tagging people to let them and educate them, that costs them money. They choose how much they want to, um, what level of processing they're going to have. Mm -hmm. They want to slow belts down and, and clean up the materials to get a higher price or just run fast and just get rid of the stuff. So there's all these decisions made before you can get to the price of materials. <laughs> and I found it way easier just to say, those are your decisions. You're just you're required to recycle it. You're required to run your own system, but we're not going to get in your business auditing your material recovery facility and all that. Well, <clears throat> that doesn't work so well now. So the last two contracts I've done for Star Island Federal Way, we've had um, a mechanism in there to roughly track a commodity index up and down, and it shows up as a separate line item on people's bills. I think Mercer Island has about a dollar sixty or dollar seventy rebate to the customer 
and the one that uh, we just just put together in federal way is a dollar rebate to the customer. So if things get better it's in the budget, we could see yeah. rebates. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we wouldn't be, I think the worry would be we'd get trapped in this yeah. higher level yeah. and then things could change and we're... I'd say it's the opposite high. because okay. actually what we negotiate when the haulers are worried about uh, commodity revenue, um, they'll agree to things that if markets do a repeat of where they were in 2011, they'll be regretting it because all of a sudden there's going to be a lot of money coming back in rebates mm -hmm. and they won't, okay. get, they won't really get access to it. Thank you. Other questions? So is there is there still an element uh, that's that's it? I mean, I, it would make sense in terms of the. Uh, is there still an element that that remains in the haulers domain? I mean, because they, they can still do all those modifications in terms of the process. Yes, there is because there the compensation going back, or whichever way it is, is based on uh, regional indexes. And so if they run their operations in a way that gives them a value that's higher than average, they keep it. Okay. And if they run an operation that's sloppier than average, and they don't even meet the commodity, okay. the average is and comes out of their pocket. Thank you. Do you see um, a change in impacting this because of the new King County solid waste strategy that's just floating around? I, I noted I mean, they were very unclear in their presentation, I thought, about how they were going to finance new facilities um, and sort of cavalierly said, you know, oh, the haulers will pay for it, but in fact, what we do. And then the second thing that they said was that they saw the potential over the next, you know, decade, I guess, or maybe sooner, that um, we would see the types of things that we recycle uh, be more limited. Mm -hmm. Do you see that impacting any of this potentially? I guess potentially around rebates. I mean, if you if you limit the products, but they're products that are more likely reusable, then in theory we might get better rebates. I suppose yes. if the market for those go yeah. up. If you get rid of the hard to recycle stuff or marginal stuff, more than likely the rebate yeah. would go up and their processing costs would go down. So I think that's accommodated. As far as King County changing. The financing method. I think the contract just has to deal with that as it ha as yeah. it happens. King County's always stayed out of collection for the most part. That's a that's clear, clearly delineated to the cities. They they've tried to coordinate things and standardize things and do all these things over the years. They can't even uh, they can't yeah. even coordinate cart colors between service areas. Yeah, so, yeah, right. No. <laughs> right. Well, it looks like we've got time for questions and answered. I really appreciate it. Uh, sure coming out and taking time with us and even offering to help support us uh, if we elect to uh, oversee a contract negotiation. So mm -hmm. we've got procurement. Procurement. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I, I have the luxury of saying I'm just not going to negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Anything else for us? Anything that we should be thinking about? Or um, I think it's there. If, if you have any other questions, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you don't have time for now. I just email them in, and I can still reply to them. You know, so that's fine. And yeah, just good luck with where you want to go. Great. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I have a cooler drive. Oh my God. Oh, I'm well. <laughs> <laughs> Your CC's ice cream downtown. So. Oh, I've heard of that. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. We had skipped over good of the order, so let's go back to that and uh, just go around. Does anyone have anything you want to share for good of the order? I had one thing. Um, and now with our new little parking lot item on the agenda, I don't know if this fits anywhere. I So I've been hearing comments about the storage facility. I think everyone's heard a little bit about that. And I guess what my question is, um, there are times when there are exceptions made um, with designs. So I just at some point, I don't know what always comes before council and what doesn't. And it's kind of our job to help the community understand certain processes to or who to talk to. So I guess at some point if we could have just a discussion to kind of explain that for maybe a future cow or so that we know like what kinds of things get, you know, there's some stuff that staff allows or I don't know how that functions fully, I guess, is what I'm saying, is when do we get notified or when do we get to make a choice 
versus staff, mm -hmm. um, just so we can explain that to the public when that comes I think up. we can have a discussion with that. Uh, there's a lot that happens. I can give you just a quick minute. It goes through a conditional use permit process, which is reviewed by the Planning Commission and Count, I'm sorry, the Planning Commission and the Hearing Examiner makes the final decision on that. And that was a really difficult process. And we had a lot of questions and comments before it even started construction. So I knew that when it started construction, there were going to be equally uh, more questions. And so I can come and give a presentation on that. That would be great when you have. When you have time, I can tell you that it's likely we're getting in another um, building that would like a conditional use permit for an even larger building than that one for uh, commercial retail and senior housing. Wow. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, that one's right out front, isn't it? <laughs> you know, people <laughs> drive by it. This I, will be too. It's right on. I mean, it's on Main Street. That's where you have your commercial and industrial land. I had some council folks from other cities near us call and say, "You officially ruined the entire valley by having a crane." <laughs> 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 Our high limit hasn't changed. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, and one thing to note too is I'll I'll ask Diana. Diana. Um, when we send out the link to the project material so you can actually see the staff report and all the information in there because that will really help. We actually did like a what's up do ball, you know, several years ago for the community to see. Um, right now it still looks pretty rough because it's all masonry, but there's still a lot of materials to be added onto that building. There's standing same metals and the materials. It's not just masonry, but it looks masonry right now because that's what they do until they punch holes through it and attach other materials to it. Mm -hmm. When it's done, you won't even see it. No, we'll see it. <laughs> we'll see it. Clear, we'll see it. <laughs> We've been watching it out. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah, I have a lot to say about that, but we can talk about it later because I, yeah, at some point, it's just hard when the reasoning is well, there, it wouldn't be viable if we didn't let them build it huge when we have code that says has certain restrictions for certain reasons and it was a public process, elected officials, and then something happens that the community doesn't understand, you know. So, that, I guess we can talk about it another time. But, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so, what I wanted to bring up is I have been noticing a lot of comments about WAVE. And, I mean, this is nothing new. And so I decided uh, to reach out to someone who had been on the committee with WAVE, with the, uh, I remember when there was the committee, I don't know how many people were on council, but there was a committee that was going to look into it. And it was back when Matt Morton was here. At any rate, um, you know, some of their recommendations, I don't think there was ever a formal letter or any type of formal recommendation? <coughs> I can't answer that. <coughs> the work of the committee was never completed under the previous staff mm -hmm. person. And in fact, I've been in contact with WAVE several times over the last few weeks, including today. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, there's, we have some areas of the city that have historically, the infrastructure has never been upgraded since it was Broad Stripe or Millennial even before that. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we have areas in the city now, for example, my neighborhood's experiencing a lot of outages and there's no explanation why. So I've reached out to their government relations um, senior manager to figure out what the heck's going on and for them to provide an explanation to us on that. Um, they have been bought out again. So um, when I met with them last fall, um, actually in the winter, in between the snowstorms, um, their, their feeling from corporate is because they have more capital, they would be able to invest more, and this is an area that they want to invest in. But since that point, I haven't heard anything new and I haven't gotten new information. So I am in contact with those folks. Uh, but again, the committee um, never finalized its work. The recommendation was pretty much go renegotiate the contract. So, um, and we all know why that hasn't occurred yet. So, um, we're getting wave go or uh, waste management going, and we have to work on wave. Um, but we also have very little control. So, um, we can have standards, but it doesn't mean um, with the federal regulations, there's very little we can actually do. Mayor, if we the council member receives a complaint from a neighbor or someone in the community, um, 
is there someone we should specifically pass that email along to um, that um, can either respond to it or at least start collecting you know some of the issues so we can categorize them when we talk to Wave? I've been keeping um, all the complaints that I personally receive from Wave, and in fact publicly have encouraged people to send them to me. So I've got a running folder of comments that have come directly to me. The biggest challenge is that most people don't contact me directly, so if I screenshot something from a discussion board and send it to Wave, they don't have anything to work on. And one of the other challenges that i found um, as I talk to people is that they get tired of holding on customer service and they never ask to escalate it to somebody higher than customer service. And most of those folks are, are low-level tech workers in a, in a call center, and part of the challenge um, in fact, with one of the outages that we had in the last year and a half is that you have um, their screens may show, on you know, their end, show that there's nothing going on. But at the site, there's a big problem. Their, their systems aren't communicating. And then also what we found with some of the bigger problems and the individual um, constituent issues that have been able to be worked out is things like um, people having too many, you know, complaining about speeds, but they, their uh, systems going into the house are taking away their speed or their kids are gaming so much that they can't do their work. Um, and so there's lots of, <clears throat> there's many, many different things. And I would say about half the time that I've had to, that I've stepped in and helped out with constitution issues, half the time it's been problems with people's equipment in their house and not anything to do with WAVE. And the other half, it's been with WAVE. So it's not as cut and dry as WAVE just providing service. It's much more complex than that. Um, and a simple change of a computer can change your, your computer, your network speed and how it interacts with your network at home. So um, I would encourage those comments when, to continue to come to me because I have a direct line to not just a Washington State person but uh, a regional West Coast person um, and it's been effective for me to contact them directly uh, with the constituent issues that have come to me. So that I would encourage that and worst case scenario send it to um, if, you, if I'm busy, send it to Diana, and Diana can help us work on it. Uh, so I'm having this issue with another provider in Monroe, and so they had a tech come out, and I needed to get a new, more higher-powered router, mm -hmm. which will cost you two or three hundred dollars. And there's routers now that you can like put to certain devices, and you can throttle certain devices within your home. So that's the other piece that at least I got from my provider as well, and as soon as we did that, it, um, it substantially increased our um, productivity at home. And that actually happened to a member of the committee. Um, that person got one gig service, ordered one gig service and wasn't getting it, and the text came out and they found out what was wrong, and now his service is great most of the time. So, um, you know, that's, I think part of it is people, I have read that some people are giving up, waiting on hold, and that's part of the problem, is that if you're not following through and following up, and escalating the issue, it's never going to get fixed. Uh, and so online complaining on Facebook is good for feeling good about it and finding out who's having problems, but I really need to be getting those directly. And then, then we can also hold them accountable when there is a contract issue. Jennifer. So when I was speaking to the person who had been on the committee, there were suggestions that we were bouncing off each other and had come up during the committee. One of them is within our current contract, we can request um, a summary of customer complaints, including timelines and methods of resolution, um, and all of, you know, kind of their customer service information. And I think that we should exercise the right to ask for that, to find out, you know, where are the problem areas, because I, I actually think there are a lot of problems. And, um, you know, of mm -hmm. course, there's always technical problems that are your own equipment, but a lot of them are not just that. Um, and then the other thing that was suggested is yes, it's great to have a, a person to send them all to, but maybe creating some kind of a log with the addresses of where they're at, or just I've some kind of way that... I've got everything in an electronic file, and uh, much of that has been sent away. So the complaints that I've received, I have record of, um, and that's part of public records retention. Great, I guess what I'm thinking is, if we do have another committee to look at this, if there was like a log of you know, the complaints that we got. I don't know if that's something that we could do. I think it would be helpful if we ever, you know. So, and I, there were some other suggestions, but um, I do think that exercising our right to ask them for the documentation of all their customer complaints would be helpful. So, I don't know if that's something we could do. We have talked about that internally in the last 
month, I'm not sure. Um, there's lots of things going on, but I did also learn this weekend that the North Hill neighborhood is having significant issues in their brand new construction. Um, so, for example, my house built 14 years ago. The construction company put the stuff on the wrong side of the house and Wade wanted to make us pay to tear up our driveway to fix it. And it would have been like $15,000. So there are lo lots of issues going on that are not, that are complex and challenging. So we, I think we just need to remember that too. Anyone else for a bit of the order? Well, we have uh, probably about 40 minutes to go through three other items, so we can move on to item two, intersection of pedestrian safety. Steve? Good afternoon, evening, Steve Leneshevsky, Public Works. Uh, a little bit for you folks, I'm not exactly sure what we're going to specifically talk about, so I have down here Stephen in the second, and then maybe a discussion on what we were planning to do, no matter what happens up at 270 minimum 50. Am I on the right track? Okay. So Steve, this is a uh, question that we asked earlier, just general uh, safety at intersections. Some of it was a lot of homes, especially this time of year, have a lot of growth out on the street can't see stop signs, so this is kind of a bit of a follow-up. Right, okay, perfect, thank you. So, um, <laughs> rush clearing is underway throughout the city, adjacent to intersections. Um, it is always a delicate balance. We try to do what we need to do to make it possible to pass productively, say that fast, um, as, a, as a pedestrian or you know, a, a motorist. And sometimes, you know, we have gotten ourselves into trouble with homeowners and trimming things where they didn't like how we trimmed or what we trimmed. So we have tried to give notice more that, hey, we're going to be here doing this. We will trim it uh, unless you'd like to because you're much more delicate probably trimming your tree that is special to you than we are because we have 157 intersections to trim. So we do try to give that opportunity. Some folks take us up on it, some folks do not, and just say go for it. And that's you know, what we need to do. So we have been clearing intersections um, as we go through town. Um, Stevens and Second is no uh, stranger to trimming. And in general, right, we like to see sight distance triangles met, which if you, for the lay person, if you have a curb return and you go 15 feet out, we like a 15 foot cut back so you can see at an at a intersection. Um, it's not always that simple and clear cut. You have topography going downhill or uphill or something slightly curving that you are marrying into. But we do like to be as diligent as we can, but yet um, just stuff just grows wild. Blackberries in the heat of summer will grow a foot a day and it is just almost impossible to keep up. Uh, right now our mowing machine is also down, which is not fun. So we are doing a lot of manual mowing with the, actually the summer helpers are kicking a lot of butt. So they're, they're out there doing, doing good, good work too. So site obstructions are certainly priority number one. Um, and we've also talked about this and I just looked at her in this transition to how we're going to be managing staff with the crew leads. Um, definitely talked about having a more productive proactive and strategic look at how we do what we do and when we do what we need to do in a more programmatic basis so we're not always firefighting um, in that sort of mentality. Uh, so I did read the report that was put out in January and it assessed the bulk of Old Town's stop control intersections. Um, so I think we're around for that. And they did specifically talk about Stevens. So Stevens has some things going you know, for it and some things going against it. It's, it's in a, a nice belly in lieu of a, a knob, so you, you, know, you're, you don't have this high point that you can't see past if you're coming and going. So you can see the intersection is open to most all direction. Um, it has a lot of right of way, which again, people have their things planted in. Sometimes that's hard for folks to understand, sometimes it's not. Um, and then of course, uh, normally, oops, roads are, if our, you know, the higher classification road gets the right of way, so to speak. So, Stevens and Second, right? Stevens is the higher classified road per our um, 
transportation program. So it, in theory, gets first right at the intersection, good, bad, or otherwise. Uh, so that specific intersection, right, is four way stop controlled now. It does meet site distance triangles. It can always be improved with vegetation management. Uh, but this one did, Transpo did say, they were very clear, it wasn't recommending, but it was a preferred scenario, as I think the terminology they use. So we're, you know, the code, dictates and lists what does and does not have a stop sign. So we can't, can't just go change things at the drop of a hat. Obviously we would need to do a study to change stuff and, and move things around, but you know, Stevens and second is what it is. Um, it's a tough call and I think improvements could be had for all directions and at this point I would probably leave it as a four-way. It seems to function well. Um, Honestly, we don't have a lot of stop complaints. Anecdotally, I've had more you know, PED-oriented style of complaints, which we can solve with some striking and some vegetation management improvements, I believe. I did see a guy blow right through on his bicycle yesterday. Going downhill like a stop sign didn't matter to him. But, um, so it's kind of that intersection in a nutshell. Questions, comments? So when I brought it up the last time, it was, um, was it possible <coughs> to put uh, striping for mm -hmm. a, you yeah, know. Like the, a sidewalk, the, crosswalk. Yes, closer. because I think it would make, right now it's pretty worn down, mm -hmm. and so just to highlight the fact that pedestrians could be crossing, and we have it at a lot of other spots mm -hmm. in the city, and so I just wasn't sure why that spot in particular, and that um, children do cross there to get to their bus stop, and so it just seemed like that would be a really great spot to have striping. So. That was when I originally brought it up. That was my yeah. my question. Yeah, no disagreement in general. It's always funding, unfortunately, comes down to most of this work. And for those who are interested, we, we haven't done anything right now either because between right about where this car is in front of the stop bar, and then down to Main Street, PSC is responsible for overlaying this this summer from all the patches they did for tying and things last last two years. So we are pushing them as hard as we can to get that done as soon as possible and then we will we would strike. Um, it would be best to have that happen in the next two weeks prior to um, King County coming and striking our roads for us through contract. Um, but we won't get it done one way or the other. It behooves them to do that, uh, but if not, then they can put all striking back, which we prefer anyway. So we are working on that in, in the now as far as PSC and overlaying that road on our behalf. And some of the other high use intersection, I mean, even Stevens and Third up the way here, it's got, you know, that one is a clear, you, know, you clearly understand that one should be four-way stop. You have very little sight distance if you're on Third heading north, looking west, you know, you're coming down the hill and you're coming across. So <coughs> you can certainly see there's one bad leg there. Um, and for those who've been around long enough, there used to be a flashing yellow above it, which we still have. In some areas, I've started seeing, I think they're called, are they called speed tables? Have you seen the triangular striping? When you get to an area, you should be slowing down. It's just a series of stripes that make a triangle, and for some reason, it visually makes people slow down, I guess. I was just curious if you had read anything about that. Not normally, no. The one thing, and when those are applied, just for those who do live near an intersection or near a road, Whatever it is on the pavement, if it's not painted down, so mm -hmm. those things are typically either ground in or thermoplastically applied. So there's actually a, a ridge. So every time a car goes over it, however many skips it has, is what you're going to hear. Uh, right. Okay. So the okay. best one is if you sit on 203 in Fall City at the parking lot, oh. uh, waiting for your, uh, <laughs> yes. your float. You'll really love those because those are ground in, and there's two sets of them because mm -hmm. they are by that crosswalk on the on the highway. So yes, there are there are alternative means out there. Um, the problem with paint is too, paint makes a lot of slippery surface and things can cause traction control. So there's always yeah, every time you think something's maybe simple or easily applied, there's always a double check that we need to do. But yeah, there are there are alternatives that we we will look at. Uh, we do have signing just in the general vicinity of 275 and 150. Um, replacement going on, no matter what's going on, con you know, construction-wise up here. So some of the new poles we'll be putting out, we're going to get away from the um, pressure-treated lumber poles. If you guys have noticed, they tend to wander and twist over time. So 
the steel poles do cost more, but they have breakaway flanges. They have the new strips you can mount to them, the retro reflectivity strips, which kind of brighten them up as well as the signs being bright and new too. So we're doing that at the park. Um, we did formally get rejected, even though we did formally ask through all the proper channels from PSC for the TIB lighting grant. They said no thank you to any extras. So we tried to get some extra lights out of the, the upgrade project. So we did our best to try. Um, so we are working on those things. And turning back intersections is just a task that is endless, especially you know. The, Really peaks April, May, and it goes slow down a bit, and then you get full sun, and then all that other stuff grows. So um, that's kind of a thought on intersection sharpening the same for those two. Any other types of questions, thoughts, comments? Um, uh, this discussion uh, brings back to the TIP and the very large body of work that citywide gets <coughs> roughly twelve point five million dollars. And, um, and this isn't a question for you to specifically answer, but um, on the citywide improvements, which this type of ongoing work would be part of, is um, when you come back to us by September 30th to tell us sort of how you prioritize and what your criteria would be, would some of those citywide improvements um, be addressed when you come back to us? Because my concern is, we had big projects, which are great, because they're necessary, they're necessary as well. But citizens are often commenting on or concerned about very specific things like crosswalks mm -hmm. or sidewalks or holes in roads. Um, I understand exactly why you don't like the pressure treated uh, pole, because at 150th in the entrance to Legacy Ridge, we've got one right now that's leaning out into the open area at about, about a 20 degree angle and um, and there's no sign that it's been hit. Right. So it's probably something like that. So um, is that, will you be looking at the citywide improvements and giving us a sense of your strategy for that? Because those are the kinds of things that really matter to voters and they need to know what we can afford and what we can't. If we don't educate them about what we can't do, they're not going to be as likely to support funding initiatives when we're desperate. So is that something you will probably give us a little bit of flavor on when you do that report? So I do have a preliminary layout of what that looks like, especially to talk about the TIB application under yeah. council tonight. What I don't have is how we prioritize programs. And my recommendation, since we really only have three programs, is to actually set aside some money annually so we don't have to continually figure out how to structure and pay for these small things. And maybe it's a two-year budget and it's an every other year thing that we just try to get as much done as we can. So those programs are important and they're hard to prioritize when you have you know, millions and millions of dollars trying to get up the well here. And we know we need $10,000 improvements you know, in five different places, but those are not specific to the tip list, so no. They're not prioritized on the way I've looked at it, but I do already, I will be recommending that we do set aside for, for those types of things. Yeah, because even the basic criteria around, I mean, the acknowledgement that we have to address this, and that to me is a real fundamental of council. I mean, these are existing citizens, and you know, we need to be you know, responding. But more important, that we are serving, you know, because holes and stuff like that, I mean, it's a real safety kind of thing. And, you know, I guess, obviously, with in absence of specifics, but I, I can see value in setting aside, even if it's a small amount of money, but if that's every year, every two years, so we can honestly say to our, our constituents, our fund is small, we wish it was bigger, we don't have ways to make it bigger, but we want you to know we're doing what we can. Yeah, I completely agree. Any other questions? Maybe? Quick one, it's related to striping. Um, with the bathroom enclosure, I was discovering some neighborhoods I don't normally drive through as much, um, especially 278 8th Avenue Northeast and 144th North, mm -hmm. or sorry, Northeast 144th Street, um, just to kind of cut around the construction on that. And a lot of those intersections don't have any stop lines at all. And right. there's one intersection that it looks like I almost didn't catch it. 
but somebody actually, I think, spray painted one. Did you, do you know? Like a month ago, somebody sprayed that. And I mean, not to encourage people to do that, but I mean, it does help because I mean, it seems they might have a problem there with people not seeing the stop. Um, so I didn't know at what point, like, what kind of timeline with projects like that, because I know that all adds up and costs money. So do you? Have, you don't have to answer no. now. You can just come back. Obviously, I just wanted to say that because I was just seeing some intersections that just they're not. -existent. There's no lines, and that's that trigger for me to look up, you know, sometimes and see a sign hidden in a bush. So, I think you hear some sympathy at this table. Oh, it, it, yeah, believe <laughs> me, it, it's all about funding because yeah. the thermoplastic at four intersection is almost $800, right? Wow. So, yeah. you know how many we have, yeah. and that's why we don't. So, you know, the signage always updated three years ago with the retro reflectivity requirement of the feds. Not perfect. That intersection has greatly improved in the last two months, though. The homeowners themselves actually trimmed those trees up oh, that's good. way better than they had been in a long time, so which mm -hmm. is very nice. But yes, there's many of those uh, those crosswalks and stop signs not marked on pavement and post. So the staff used to actually spray them out themselves. So it's just kind of hokey because they should be thermoplastic, which right. has reflectivity glass beads in them. Mm -hmm. But it's just expensive and we haven't been able to afford that. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's something, you know, we're interested in, we can go back to spraying crosswalks. We actually would borrow the school district sprayer because they do all their own parking lots. So a little quick pro quo, we'll run a blade through their parking lots when we're out and about doing snow removal and then they'll let us borrow stuff when they're not using it. The peak of their action is in the summer, right, because they have all their mm -hmm. summer helpers doing all their, all their crew work on all the properties. Mm -hmm. So then come fall, they're back into buildings and everything else. And they can pick things up kind of before and after. So it's, it's a yeah. good relationship. But John Mark is retiring in a month, so mm -hmm. we'll see who the new person is that we get to deal with because he's been in. So we contract all the thermal? When we do thermal, the, we use a service contract through King County through an ILA. So we use their rates. And they are very competitive. They do our striping as well. But it's still a per unit cost. So we can quote out strike right or you know just get a quote from, from those types of folks. Mm -hmm. But then, kind of like what Jeff was saying with waste management, then we have to put a bid package together on right. what we do and don't do. And you know, if you don't have a base bid that they can count on making some money on, they're not going to want a base bid with all these little ads for you know these other 50 intersections. So it's kind of tough. You either kind of go all in or you don't. And when you're ready to go all in, you get a number you, you can't choke, right? So it's it's a fine balance. But we also have to put together another bid package. Steve, thanks for bringing this back to us. This was an important question, and I think you need your citizens. You know, I see driving around. I'll throw out a unique idea. Little Avery, who's just a little toddler in our neighborhood, does chalk drawings on the sidewalk. I always, I you're forced to slow down to look how cute. <laughs> mayor, one of the things that uh, I know is a possibility. Certain times of the year, in the mayor's newsletter, we can put out information for folks whether it's learning drains when the fall leaves mm -hmm. come down in front of your house. Um, that might be an area that we could put out in the summertime, especially with all this growth. Mm -hmm. It's so much nicer to have a homeowner go out yeah. and, and trim up, and maybe it's a, a reminder. I know that we're limited on what we can put on. Yeah, no, we can pay. definitely, that's, that's easy to do. It's we something to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's something we could write up and put out to citizens, and you don't know how much that will help, but it might be worth doing. Well, we're down to about uh, 20 minutes now, and our next item, um, Depot Deck Replacement. Steve, that's you. Okay, I'm sure everybody's very excited about this. Uh, some of the good news before the rest of it. So there was a contract for that amount uh, to demo, and the work completed was under under the bid, so that's good news. We will need every penny. Um, what was identified is significant rot in the bottom of the structure. So the foundation itself has a, a Mary plate on it, which is usually pressure treated lumber, which ours is, because the foundation was built in you know, the mid-2000s. What was existing was the remainder of the structure, so there's stringers under the, under the depot deck, and then it has a border around it that holds it on place. That border is then covered and then siding. Um, Andy, our architect, had come back out, and we looked at it after the fact. And the way the flashing, which was installed, which was not done with how, when we moved the building, it came that way. It just had that. That was it, and that was that. Um, that flashing was not protecting that face board. 
So you have this flashing that's supposed to keep water wicking away from the siding. Well, it didn't do that, so it got in between the siding and then the structure board around the trim of the building. It is good on the, what is that direction, east side, because that one was covered in concrete lap siding when it was moved, based on topography and what was happening over there, so that one was changed. But the other three sides are still the original. Um, for some reason, the north-facing side isn't too bad, and why we couldn't see a lot of this. When you look from underneath, we identified that rock section in that area because you could see it on the front side. Well, when they pulled this off, you could see it plenty from the front side because that's where it starts to rot. Where we thought it was, it had migrated all the way through the wood. The rest of it, it had not yet migrated through, and it just had <coughs> gone deteriorated super, super fast, and it is gone. Um, you know, we went down there, and you can just take your little pocket knife and, and go away. So the front two to five inches of each stringer is then rotten, right? So there are ways to repair this. Um, what we have done, we did call the architect, working on a plan, we filed a plan with insurance. Uh, insurance has said, hey, termite bug damage is not covered. But we argue this isn't bug damage. The bugs are secondary. The rot and the water intrusion was primary. So we're working out that process. Who knows where it's going to go and what they're going to cover. Um, but they were very responsive. Um, they had a, whatever day, Thursday, Friday, they had someone up by the following Wednesday. So they're working with us on what we do or don't do. We do need to get it, um, interestingly enough, so that uh, the east side, which is still bolted to the foundation, right? That has a good ridge, which resting on, and there's a ridge beam under the middle of the whole structure. So half of the building is set, and there are a few piers that are west of the ridge beam, which are still helping hold it in place. But we do need to get some sort of cribbing structure underneath for the far west side, just so it doesn't tend to migrate and make it even worse. Um, so we're working on that. That is a approximate, I think. like five-ish thousand, five to ten pages to get that done, just to put the structure underneath temporarily keep it from moving anymore. Um, go back. Exterminator has, has been out. As soon as it opened up, whatever termites were there, Alana thought she said she saw some, but by the time the next day they were gone, and termites apparently don't like to stay where they can be seen, mm -hmm. so they will go away. But what was still there are called wet ants, because um, I saw something moving around and we were looking at it and they look like a little sugar ant, but they're kind of a brownish transparent kind of color and they come once it's wet and deteriorating and then they start to eat. And they just, they were, they're just hanging out. They're not going anywhere. So it is, he's totally fine with it being open right now. It's getting air moving, it's drying it, it's making everything way better than it could make anything worse. Not being covered, even if it rains, he said it's just leave it open until we figure out a plan and move forward because this will help for the time being. Um, so yes, the little wet ants were present, and by his account, and I agree, are a secondary indicator of, of the situation that was wet first, but wasn't made wet by termites eating through the wood. Um, so the cold terminator, they didn't really recommend doing much because we can poison it to kill something, but it's the damage is done. So when you cut the rod away, then they said, you know, we can do a treatment then, but as long as there's nothing going to eat, they're not going to be here. So he was up front with that. And we have called a couple contractors to come out and then help us understand if we, and it's going to be a time and material type of contract, because um, we're going to go stringer by stringer to figure it out. So I think I hit all these points. Yeah, so scoping that repair. So believe it or not, it is super ugly, and what we will have to do. And it, it, Again, an architect, he sees this every day. He was telling us, oh, I've seen the whole wall gets eaten out, and you know the sheetrock's standing there, and there's nothing in between it. And it's, the good news is not that bad. So this this board, you know, is rotten, and then all the stringers that rest under under it, at, you know, 16 inch spacing or whatever it is under that structure. Again, the edges are rotten, but once you go internal, like the crawl space is dry, it's tidy. It's really a shame that it is like this on the board, but we'll have to remove. And he just recommended going up to this, this little ridge plate, peel it all back. There was really no sheeting. There's no wet membrane protection. There's no Tyvek paper. You know, it's just like the 
wicking paper that was there was actually like a paper. And I don't even think it was like a like a wax treated parchment like you have in cooking. It was like straight up paper. So pull it all back, get all the rot out, and cover back up appropriately. And you can see the little piece of metal flashing. Um, it was in there, but it was not in the right spot. So it just and it was consistent, unfortunately, all the way around. Is it still play right now? No, PT is fine. So it is just that fur that was under there, and the spur hemlock, whatever, when they, when they built that thing. But that's the status. So working on a plan, and the only way I think we can quote this out, not knowing how far around we can go, one, two, expect the whole thing gets fixed on all sides. Rip all four. You can, you know, we can get a measurement all the way around. You're coming up three feet, pulling all the siding off, repairing every stringer, whether you like it or not, and bid that way, or you can. Bid on their time materials where hey, our time is going to be bid at you know 50 bucks an hour, and materials are going to have an eight percent markup, and at least people can give you some sort of competitive bid that we can measure against. We're going to have to have something we can cause a metric against. Um, you're going into it, of course, naked in that sense, where we don't know how much we're going to do, but it has to be prepared. Questions? Of course, I don't. Okay. Final comment, actually. Um, and when I first, we've talked about this project several times, Steve and I. Um, when I first, uh, I was down there, first of all, right after my dental surgery. So, I mean, I was literally there by noon. And I saw it, and I knew exactly what the situation was. Um, and I had been down there a number of times before, looking at the deck. And, um, and you may remember I asked you for a copy of the architect's contract because I wanted to see if it was a full service contract, which it was. But one of the things I noticed uh, between when I originally looked at the deck prior to removal, <coughs> when I read the architect's contract and their, their website with their expertise, which includes, by the way, if anybody has ever looked at it, water, water infiltration. One of the things I was really surprised about prior to this removal um, and made, my, made me concerned was I did not see deck boards removed or cut, you know, sawzall trying to explore around the base of the building. But when I looked at the architect's contract, he wasn't really expected to do that, quite frankly. So I don't think you can hold the architect responsible. Um, but in, but I believe that should have been done. And um, I don't know that the architect would have had to do it. So that's a comment. I think spot testing, particularly around thresholds, would not be uncommon with old buildings like this. So lesson learned, I think. And we have three more buildings that are old. Um, and old buildings just, they deteriorate very differently than anything you ever read in the textbook. I do think the time and materials is probably the best way to go. So, um, because if, even if you bid it, all that would happen is you'd have to have like 25 or 30 percent in your back pocket. And there really wouldn't be an easy way to bid it, so people are going to give you high bids. So I think that's the best way to bid it. Um, and in one of our discussions, you pointed out that this facility actually makes us money. Not a lot. But unlike our other facilities, which aren't making us money, that's worth noting, and it is something that the community, you know, values. Um, and all of this has to get taken into consideration. So, um, I guess one other comment was, and I don't know if the architect did it, but um, the various times I looked under the deck prior to this work, um, I really didn't. My impression was that nobody had ever gone into the the, the concrete side. Now, because that, that, the grate was never tampered, did not in any way appear to be tampered with, and when I went there after the removal, it still looked like it had not been moved. And so, again, another lesson learned, because I think in old buildings, and, and particularly ones that have been moved, um, you really have to get under there. So, when your staff does work on, because we've got other weird foundation stuff coming up, um, just a comment to share. And I'm not, 
placing blame or anything like that because this is not public works primary line of business, you know, and I think people do the best they can. Um, but I think timing materials is the way to go. And that's the method I've seen used most in these situations. Um, it would be best if you can find a contractor that has worked on small historic projects. This is not a historic building. We have to maybe feel like that, we might cherish it that way, but it is not a 106 building. So um, we really don't have to worry about using, you know, a hardy board type trim at the base or something we don't have to worry about. You know, we, we aren't replacing in kind like you do under federal regulations or anything. So yeah, it is a very basic structure, which is the good news. That is the good news. And old buildings are often first cut timber, and it's amazing how well they can perform. Mm -hmm. They defy logic. Yeah. They really do structurally. So and that's a good thing. I do. I was not here, but I do believe they did go under because that's where they found a lot of that around on that corner. So I maybe don't know, not. Maybe history, but yeah. Maybe and not far enough. This corner too, if you've been inside there, is one of the entrances to the bathroom yeah. the hallway, and it actually has laminate, which has a quarter inch threshold over the wood, and under the laminate was actually plywood. You can see from underneath. So this corner has a little bit of that plywood flooring from too. Yeah. Other questions? But the other, the other part of the structure, just quickly too, a lot of the flooring it has a six inch uh, tongue groove fur under floor, and it's on diagonal which is really good for mm -hmm. structure for structural, yeah. And then you have, you know, the, like, what is it, one by three, the oak, is just laid um, perpendicular to the wall, so. There is, one, yeah, there is one thing in this, because I'm sure we're going to be talking about what the deck is going to look like in the future. Um, one of the things I noticed in the write-up by the architect on the concrete deck versus the wood deck, I don't know if people notice this, but he was talking about a custom mill decking material so it matched the period. I really don't think we need to do that. Yeah, there were, I think there were three alternatives. There also. were, yeah. but that is one. And then sure. on the concrete, he's talking about imprinting the concrete right. to look like wood. There again, we don't necessarily yeah. need to do that fancy because it is not a historic building from a technical standpoint. So we do have chances, to, I think, to go back and scale back the decking and, and the means and method by which we reinstall. Maybe I'll have four jumping. Yes. So that building is designated as a culturally significant building, so materials are supposed to be light per period. So while it's not on a national register, it's locally significant, and we have policies for that. Who, who decides what light by period is? That's right. The planning director? Well, Good. <laughs> so I'm just saying, that, and, and, and so I just want you to know that because we've had some buildings where we've had to do restoration, and that's been our long standing policy since before I came here. Obviously, we try to make sure and be reasonable as well and provide different options. The other um, item that we have too is that we're required to go through the family that donated the facility to us and get approval for um, modifications and changes to the building as well. So. Well, that, that's all fine, but right now we're making a decision about how big a deck will be. I know, I, so, I would just provide some that's good. to that we don't get to just randomly choose materials. Hey. I had a question well, I just want to follow up and confirm about the bugs. So mm -hmm. termites have left because it's all open. Since it's open, has it dried enough now? There are no wet ants there currently? There were, last I looked, they were there and not gone back to check. Okay, because I was, is that something that the exterminator should spray to just kill them? Or are they expected to just go away too? I just, I'm always worried, is yeah. it going to spread? You know, I mean, yeah, I'm right. yeah. I, it I won't get more wet, that's okay. what he said. He wasn't concerned that they were there. We figure we're going to handle this fairly quickly. So, I'll certainly treat. But he, the, the, the exterminator fellow, was an English. Just a, two cents. Uh, the stuff that kills ants is, is like one of the most toxic yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. pesticides. And so, if there's any, that would be like a last resort. No, it's for sure. Like yeah. A very serious uh, bad for the environment. Mm -hmm. but, and it's uh, right there. And the from what I've seen, I don't know, around here, it's the water first and then it's mm -hmm. everything else later. But, um, yeah. yeah. I will check again. 
just want to keep a close eye on it to make sure. And then how do we know for sure that it's, did, was anything pulled out or opened? I mean, there's, did they look in the walls or, because you said for sure it's just there. We pulled as much siding, which is a lot of, pretty much up to this okay. data board, you can pull so you that. in there, okay. Mm -hmm. So you look to get good wood and said, yeah, we yeah. Know. Yeah. Even on this far, you know, the, the south facing side, where most of that is just sun beaten, you can peel back and it was, you know, okay. once you got off the sill plate, you were up six inches behind the siding, then it was fine. I would say this though, in an old building, you can never be sure. No. And I think if you're yeah. in for a penny, you're in for well, a pound on this. I think for sure. my home was built in 2008 and they didn't do a lot of flashing right now. <laughs> Northwest exposes all poor crafts. <laughs> My doctor says the same thing. You look good in shape, but you can never <laughs> tell. <laughs> Steve thinking, by the way, the rec center uh, had a lot oh, of Just put it on a list. It's, it's, things are on a list. Just it's a long night, list. It's night and day. It's all cleaned up. It looks really good. Thank you. For that is summertime health. They are very close to getting. Oh, did you go read? Oh, yeah, did they, they go read it? it? Yeah. Right. Oh, I drove by the other day and I was like, oh, I gotta go get my gardening gloves. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, it's it's really awesome. well done. Yeah, Thank you. Because they were really oh, scrubbing some of that growth like, into the foundation. Yeah. You know, maybe we should have a, the next retreat should be a gardening. <laughs> there you go. Uh, a gardening party. A weeding party? Yeah. 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 Maybe you should be careful how you raise that. Right. Come for lunch. Come for lunch. So, Diane, we have about three minutes, maybe five, if we stretch it. Can you do this justice in that amount of time? Yeah, okay. I can. So, Diane's going to talk to us about affordable housing tax credit. Yeah. So, this was um, a house bill passed by the legislature that we can take advantage of. Um, and it's basically, if you do all these steps, you get access to this money. If you don't do these steps, you don't get access to this money. And you have a very short amount of time to do these steps. And then you get this money for 20 years. Um, and for us, because we don't currently have an affordable housing tax of our own um, to generate affordable house housing um, revenues, um, we qualify for the slightly lower amount, which would generate, uh, based on last year's sales tax, um, about $8,800 a year, which isn't a whole lot in the grand scheme of addressing affordable housing, but because we are a small municipality, we can use it for um, uh, rent assistance and utility assistance. So those are things, especially with utility assistance, we definitely have the capacity to do that. Um, uh, Council Member um, Balducci at King County is um, working um, with council members to put together a proposal that they're going to request the, the communities that take advantage of this pool their resources together and sort of work with ARC or some other sort of organization to address housing at a much larger scale. It's obviously, each unique municipality doesn't raise a whole lot of money to address it, but if we pull it all together, we raise more. Um, they're going to be working over the next couple of months on that proposal. Um, she, um, SEA, sent the letter out, will forward it on to all of you. Um, but they have a couple recommendations, and they're going to be kind of formalizing those proposals um, and listening to that. They're hoping by September to have a formal like, request that communities do this. Um, so that's another thing to think about. Um, but otherwise, if we just chose to take advantage of this, we'd receive you know a couple thousand dollars every year. We could put towards utility assistance, which would be that alone would be great for the community. So um, we have to pass a resolution, I believe, by the end of the year, saying that we would like to do this, and then we have to do one another step after that within a year, and then we qualify for getting this money every year. Sounds like a slam dunk is the right thing to do, but I just wanted to get a sense from uh, council. So what you would be looking for us is whether we should bring forward an agenda bill? Yeah, so I can bring forward a resolution at a future meeting to sort of kind of move this along. Um, I can, I'm assuming that other communities will start bringing them forward over the next couple of weeks to months. So we can always just kind of pull from their example and not reinvent the wheel um, and sort of see what other communities are doing and then kind of move Or you forward. can be the first. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, and then but, pen and page stores. but if you're interested <laughs> in doing this, then obviously we can move forward with it. Yeah, so. somebody would like to move forward with that. Seems like a slam dunk unless I miss yeah. something. <laughs> yeah, I kept yeah. waiting for the catch. Like, yeah. I'm like, what's yeah. the catch? Yeah. But, but, but moving forward does not mean we have to pool in with King County. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah, or they, Arch yeah. in particular. Or any organization. Yeah. Right. Like, that was one of the recommendations. Yeah. A grant could be a lot for our community. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. really make a big difference. difference. Yeah. Yeah. And, it is, and it's definitely, it's very targeted on who can access the money. It's not, it's certain thresholds that they have to meet to qualify for this. Um, we, so we might have to go through a couple extra step, steps to make sure we are actually accurately identifying those people that qualify and making sure that people who get the money really do qualify. But um, I mean, I think it'd be great. It's not that hard to, it, it, no. to standardize that. No. When you bring it back, would you mind ex explaining? I think we already have utility assistance. So we have like on our bills similar to what PSE does we say you know do you want to donate to helping hands fund yeah. through hope link so oh, we wow. take in the money we separate out any donations to a separate bars and then once a month once a quarter once a year whatever it ends up being we send a check to hope link and then when people call us asking you know saying I can't you know pay my bill or whatever mm -hmm. we suggest that they contact hope link we also suggest that they contact holy innocence who works through st vincent you know so we just say you know try contacting these people the one thing i don't know 100 for sure is if because it's been so long since we've had this set up is if the helping hands fund at hope link if do not if duval people donate to it mm -hmm. is it only duval people who get it so if we were to go with this uh, a resolution and, and get the funding directly, we would be able to manage the Duval money goes to Duval people. So, I mean, again, I don't know 100% for sure if the Hope, Help Link, Hope Link thing does or not, but, and I don't know, last I heard donations weren't very big. But that also goes to people who don't necessarily need specific income thresholds. It's just, it's tight this month and I need assistance, and you know, I've had a medical emergency and I need help this month. Whereas this is specifically for income thresholds, so it'd be potentially different um, people would be affected. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.